Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain. My name is Carly, and I'm going to be the moderator again for today. If you're watching on a desktop or on a laptop computer, you're going to see the chat function right next to our video here. If you're watching on a cell phone, I believe it's right below. But you can send any questions or comments you have there, and then we'll try to answer as many as we can today. If programming like this is something that you value, please consider making a donation over at MajesticTheater.com. And you can send any feedback you have to Majestic Theater, um, oh, sorry, info at MajesticTheater.com. And now I would love to introduce da Danny and JT. Thanks, Carly. You're welcome. Hey, Hi, everyone. Carly. Hey, JT. Happy Sunday, everybody. Uh, hey. Thanks, uh, thanks for uh, joining us once again for another episode of Behind the Curtain at the Majestic. Uh, kind of an informal process. Uh, let's see, uh, so, some uh, a quick few notes. You know, we have uh, The Little Princess, our children's theater production of The Little Princess streaming right now. Uh, you can get to it via our website. And we've also archived uh, Jungle Book and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, as well as our previous Behind the Curtain episodes. Uh, so just go to our website if anybody wants to check any of those things out. Now, really excited about this news. Um, most of you, I, I trust, will have gotten a letter from us by now. Um, we're reopening the Majestic on January 9th, and we're going to uh, pick it up with what where we had to uh, suspend our production of the pitch in the middle of the run. We're going to pick it up with the pitch, and that'll be followed by a really uh, fun, quirky musical called Murder for Two. Um, and uh, Craig Eastman and Bo Fitz and the Yank Kelt Band and uh, Dave Kane and Miss Givings, those shows are all rescheduled. So if you had tickets for those, they, were, uh, they are still valid. And then in April, we do my new play called Betty in the Patch, and we conclude our season uh, with nine to five, which would have been running like a year ago, but it's going to be <laughs> a year from now. So, uh, and our 25th season, uh, you know, people have been asking about this and asking about this. Uh, we open it with a production of Buddy, the Buddy Holly story. Once again, <laughs> now, um, one other quick note, couple other quick notes, um, putting together a, uh, zoom, playwriting workshop. It'll run for uh, six weeks, uh, be probably a week day during the evening for an hour and a half or so. If anybody's interested, we will have some uh, more information on our website probably toward the end of this week. And lastly, next week, uh, my guest uh, on Behind the Curtain at the Majestic is West Springfield's very own Robbie Simpson. <laughs> okay, that was a lot to get out of the way. Thanks for hanging in there, JT. I'm fine. I'm looking forward to hearing from Robbie. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, you are a, a pretty familiar face to our audience. <laughs> yes, you've watched me age over the years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're not from the Valley here. How, so how did you find us in... Uh, what was your very first show here? Well, how I found uh, The Majestic uh, was through a good friend of mine, Zoya Kachadorian. Now, Zoya had, I think, just directed uh, the, your, your show, The Ride. Yes. And uh, Zoya and I went to Syracuse University together. Now, Zoya is younger than I am, but we were there at the same time. That's how we became friends. And Zoya knew that you were planning on doing Inherit the Wind and that you were looking for the two leads in that, the Clarence Darrow role of Henry Drummond and the William Jennings Bryan role of Matthew Harrison Brady. And so she gave me a call and said, you better send a picture and resume to Danny Eaton over at the Majestic. And, uh, I so I asked what, what was going on and she explained that you, you were doing this. So anyway, make a long story short, I sent you a picture and resume and sure enough, uh, you gave me a call. And as I tell my friends, this was back in the uh, Jurassic period. Uh, we didn't have <laughs> cell phones at the time. 
And uh, in New York, you had, if you were an actor, you had, maybe you had a pager. If you were a commercial actor and you had to be uh, somewhere in the next hour and a half, you carried a pager. But most everybody had, still had an answering service like they had in uh, The Bells Are Ringing or you know, that you called into several times a day to see if they had any messages for you. And they'd say, no, you're clear, which meant nobody wants you. Uh, or you had your own answering machine. Those were becoming popular at the time. Anyway, I forget what I was doing. I think I was doing a, a rehearsal for something. And uh, I called in. I, I, we had a break. I went downstairs out on the street, corner of 54th Street and 8th Avenue. And I called in and there was a message from you. And so uh, the other thing that actors in New York at the time did, you never left home without a literally a pocket full of quarters to put into those pay phones. So uh, I called and we had a long conversation uh, on the telephone, several, <laughs> many quarters worth, uh, just discussing the, the play and uh, what you were looking for. And I thought uh, physically I was probably right for the Clarence Darrow role. And so, right. uh, you know, that was, um, so I got the, you know, called back from you uh, to say, I think we decided right then and there, frankly, that, yeah, I'd love to do this. You know, let me know if it's still gonna happen. And, and indeed it did. So my first show up there at the Majestic was uh, Inherit the Wind. Inherit the Wind. Yes, which is a great play. And it was a nice production. Good people. Walter Mantani played the uh, Matthew Harrison Brady role, and Walter was great to work with because he's one of the only other actors I know who chews the scenery even more than I do. So <laughs> we made a good pair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what what brings you back to the Majestic? You know, is there something different? Uh, something you find special about working there? Yes, well, you know, there's, there's a, you call, that's, that's, that's the first thing is you call and say, you know, hey, I'm doing such and such, would you like to do that? And I go, yes, of course I would. Uh, but the, the Majestic is really, uh, it's, there, there are many things. First of all, just the physical plant at the, at the Majestic is great. It's a wonderfully uh, intimate theater. It seats, what, 200 20 is that what yeah 229 right is it 20 so yeah. right now yeah but it seems like everybody is right you know an arm's length away from you so it's a it's a wonderful space to work in because uh it just feels so intimate uh one of the other things uh, that we have you know there that I don't get anywhere else, really, uh, at least not in my experience uh, our rehearsal studio and the shop are right next to each other on Baldwin's, Baldwin Street. So as rehearsals go on, bingo, pieces of that set appear in the rehearsal hall constantly. So by the time we make the transition from the rehearsal hall to the stage, we've already been, literally been on the set. That's from Escanaba and Love. Uh, Alphonse Sodi, the patriarch of the Sodi family. I'm seeing a picture of me and a shotgun. <laughs> the Sodi clan, yeah. So Sodi clan, yes, which was a really fun comedy to do. Uh, but that, so those are two things about working there. Uh, you folks at the theater, I mean, everybody knows, are really fun to work with. You've got good people up there. All of the, you know, local cast and crew members up there are really fun to work with. And as an extra bonus for me, of course, uh, the uh, the housing on Baldwin and the rehearsal is just down the block from the Big E. From the Big E. Right. Uh, and I'm sorry, but I spend most of my time with the cows and the horses and the sheep down at the Big E when I was in rehearsal. Uh, not in rehearsal, in performance. Once we'd opened the show, my days were pretty much free. And uh, I got my 17-day pass for the Big E for, I think, three years in a row. And then, then you decided to call me for a different slot. I was always in that first show. And yeah, it seemed like, yeah. Yeah, it was, and for the first, I think, three shows that I did. Uh, and so the Big E is also a, 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 a big, a, a big incentive to come and work there. Even now, when I, when I come up, there's always something there. There's a dog show. There's something going on. That, Horse show. Be, yeah, there's oh, yeah. Except, except now. 
Yes, except right now, of course, everything's but shut there's down. There's a big debate. I think uh, they are, my understanding is they are still planning on uh, having the big fair opening wow. uh, in September. So, yeah, you know, knock on wood, we'll knock see. Knock on wood that it can be done, yeah. You know. Um, but, so well, anyway, you, I love coming back. You, you, know. you I mean, they're, they're also, uh, you know, people who miss you, but there are animals who miss you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at the at the house there are birds and squirrels. I have I bought a bird feeder. I know the first year I got there, and right. I, go, <laughs> I go through forty pounds of bird seed easily uh, in a, a couple of weeks up there, and uh, peanuts on on the uh, back porch. So I've got squirrels coming up. I'm sure there are little squirrels knocking on the door. You know, when the next cast come in comes in, going, Where, "Where's that old guy?" Uh, we get he gives us peanuts. And we just had a funny comment here from uh Jennifer. Is, is that your Jennifer? That would be my daughter, probably. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, Yes, you are Dr. Doolittle with the animals. <laughs> yes, here in New York, I have you know, in Central Park, I've got squirrels and birds and whatever that flock to me. I used to have uh, he's he's not around right now. Uh, a blue jay in Central Park that I could just hold up a peanut and he'd fly down, land on my arm and climb up and grab it and take it on his way. So, yes, I do have a way with little feathered and furry creatures. Um, of the shows you've you've done here for us, uh, do you have a favorite or, you know, what are some of your favorites? Well, it, it's always hard to pick a favorite. I love doing in here at the Wind. It was the first you know, show, of course, and uh, I got to know the theater, so that was that was a great experience. I loved our second show, Trying, uh, Sandra Blaney and I. Uh, she's just a wonderful actress to work with. So that was just a pleasure. I think the three of us, you directing and, and Sandra and I, it was wonderful because we were all on the same page right from the first read through. And, and it's a charming, you know, really lovely little play. And I really enjoyed doing that one. Uh, I always like, I laugh because I like doing, uh, I loved doing Greater Tuna with Jim Hartman because he's one of the, you know, funnier people on the planet. But I, I've really had a, a great time with uh, all the shows that I've, that I've done up at the Fantastics uh, and for, and for different reasons. Um, the, I, I left, actually I left the production of the Fantastics in New York uh, when I was doing it off Broadway to come up to uh, uh, the Majestic to do the porch, Jack Neary's play. It, it was uh, almost new, and that's kind of fun to work on something that you know nobody else has done. Oh, well, there's a wonderful picture of me from 1812. Uh, I'm the guy in <laughs> in black. I guess it would be on the uh, left left hand side of your screen. I played the mute. It was my first job off Broadway. Um, That's you in the top hat. In the top hat, yes. The hat was almost as tall as I was. <laughs> but uh, so I, enjoy, I mean, I enjoyed doing that because it was somewhat of a new play. And then, you know, the last show that I that I just did up there, the world, the war, and Walt Whipple, uh, that was great, Danny, because it was brand new and it's and it's very exciting. I like the play, period. But it's always very exciting to work on something new that. You don't have you don't have a vision of you know three other people that may have done it before sure. or 112 people you know sometimes you know you you look at a play and you see that so and so was the original and you think oh boy those are big shoes to fill or well I know how he did it now how do I do it so those were some I mean but I truly have enjoyed all of the the experiences the. Um how did how did you get started in in, in theater? You know, what was your, I mean, did you always uh, as a as a child even did you always uh, think of yourself as I'm going to be an actor someday? No, I don't think I thought of myself as an actor. I did all of those you know things that, that the kids do. I remember in third grade getting um, plays out of now in my memory it's boy boys life. There were little playlists that they used to publish and getting the kids in my class to do them. I also, I, re I remember <laughs> vividly that I used to lead, uh, uh, I would fix up my 
uh, basement at my house into a haunted house. And I'd lead tours of it with the neighborhood kids for, you know, come in for two cents. And, you know, that was what we could buy candy with later. So I, I did do those sort of things. Uh, it really wasn't until um, high school that I that I got truly involved in it. And that was <laughs> the, the easy answer is, why did you get in theater? To meet girls. Um, <laughs> it was, that's the truth. So it was, I went to an all boys high school. In my freshman year, the all girls high school across town decided they wanted to do some plays and they needed guys. So they called, I guess, my school. And it just seemed like, you know, I could be one of five guys at a school, you know, that was all girls. And that seemed like a good idea. Anyway, I did that. And I really did enjoy it. And because I started to do that, I got involved at my own school in uh, public speaking. I did uh, I did what they call dramatic interpretation, which basically is doing monologue, sometimes dialogue. Sometimes you do two different characters talking to each other. And that was my specialty. I was, thank you very much, the New York State champion by the time I was in my junior year. I couldn't go to the, the funny thing is I couldn't go to the national finals because my school didn't belong to the right organization. Oh, we could go yeah. up to the state, but uh, their emphasis was not, it, it was a, truly it was a very uh, academically oriented uh, high school, but uh, their main concern was athletics. <laughs> and I wasn't on the, <laughs> I wasn't on the basketball team or the football team. So mm, we don't need to join that organization. Uh, so anyway, I did those things in, in high school. And when it became time to go to college, uh, that was sort of my interest. And uh, I know that I was the only person in, I think my school was well, almost 100 years old at that point. And I was probably the first person who ever went to a guidance counselor and said, uh, I'm, I'm interested in doing drama. So it was an, uh, it was a, an all boy Catholic high school. Uh, so the immediate choice, of course, was Catholic University, which did have a, a pretty good program, uh, although their graduate program was really the, the thing that gave them a name, and then Syracuse University. So I was a townie. I'm from Syracuse. So it was going to be an obvious choice because I needed um, some scholarship money uh, uh, to, so I would need to do it in state or I would get money if I did it in state and it was supposed to be a good program. So that's where I went. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, then, then they, they had a um, an attached uh, theater company there. Yes. Now that was the, 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 the biggest thing or the best part of Syracuse. Uh, there's now a wonderful company at Syracuse stage. But my freshman year, this professional company started and it was called Syracuse Repertory Theater. So for a good part of the year uh, in the springtime, we would have professional actors there doing it. I think they did four or five shows in in a season and their seasons are there. The shows would run, I think, three weeks. Uh, but we had access to that. So we had access. We could go uh, watch rehearsals. Uh, my job 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 at the time was uh, assistant box office manager at the theater. So I could, I watched every, once I got, <laughs> once I got the show started and counted up the money and did those things that I had to do, I could watch every performance again and again and again. And that was a wonderful learning experience. Now I worked with them, with the company Circus Rep as a student uh, in uh, production of Three Penny Opera. Uh, I'm trying to think if I did anything else for them as a as a student, but at one point, uh, the both the the artistic director of the theater, Rex Henrio at the time, saw me in many productions uh, at the university, and so they were doing a new play called Live and Well and Living in Argentina, and the role there was a role for the unknown soldier, and he asked me if I could do it, and I said, well, I'd love to do it, uh, but I can't leave the job in the box office because I actually have a family to support along with paying for school. And he said, okay, uh, we'll hire you. So they hired me into the equity company. Uh, the following year, I came back uh, for the whole season. This was uh, the first show I did, Alive and Well. That was the last show in a season. And then uh, the following year, I came back and did, uh, did the entire season, uh, which actually included the fantastic 
Fantastics, uh, which is how I made my first connection with that. Yeah, show. we should talk about the Fantastics and Sullivan Street. Oh, yes. How it ended up at the Snapple and then <laughs> it, it, it closed. And has there been any uh, any talk of a revival in New York? <laughs> There's always talk of the revival of the revival of the revival sort of thing. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. I don't know that anything's, you know, of course, you know, right now, everything is. Everything uh, shut down, yeah. Now, there's a picture. That's that's me and uh, Roger Patnoid doing uh, uh, Henry and Mortimer, the old actor. Now, as I said, I did, uh, I did uh, uh, play uh, the mute in a production of The Fantastics at Syracuse. So when I came to New York, and this would be 90, or this would be... 1971, I think, I immediately sent a picture and resume to uh, uh, the Fantastics, to the Sullivan Street Playhouse. And about a year later, in, say, 72, I got a call and uh, went in to audition for, for The Mute. And <laughs> everyone asked, well, how do you audition for a role that has no lines? Do you just stand there? <clears throat> and part of it was you just stood there and uh, part of the role, of course, you you play a wall. You have you have to hold a stick out at arm's length for 25 minutes uh, at, in the in that production. Uh, so I guess you you need uh, good muscles for that. Uh, but basically, I went. I saw the show. Um, most every production of the of the show has some variation on the same uh, set. It's a platform with uh, poles holding it up. Ours at Sullivan went from the ceiling to the floor, so they were quite substantial. Um, and what happens in the very beginning of the play, the mute comes on, uh, buttoning up his costume, and suddenly realizes there's an audience here. We are either late or the audience is early, but it's time to start the show. So the mute takes a little bow, runs across the stage, swings on a pole, jumps up out onto the platform, runs across the platform, jumps onto the box that the old actor and the Indian come out of, swings another pole, uh, lands on the ground and whips open that box to start giving folks their costumes. That basically was the audition. So I had to come in, run, swing the pole, uh, a series of poles. The pole, run across the stage, swing another pole, leap into the air, land on, on, uh, on well, the this, this must have been right at, right at Sullivan Street. Then, this right? was, a, yes. That's yeah, the other yeah, kind it was very interesting. I mean, it was great to do an audition because you're actually doing it on the set, which didn't move down there. Um, so that was, you know, a new sort of experience. Normally you're auditioning in a little room that has nothing to do with where you're going to do the show right. uh, again. Um, but that was my, so that was my audition. And they told me right off the bat, they will put you in the callback file. And two years later. <laughs> called you back. They called me back. Uh, down at the Sullivan, it was interesting because this is, uh, uh, this would be, I went into the show in 1976. The show itself opened in 1960. So it had been running for 16 years by the time I got into it. Uh, but unlike many other things, we had uh, Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt, the uh, authors. Tom wrote the book uh, and the lyrics and Harvey wrote the music. They were still hands-on involved with the production. So they would be there all our, uh, not all, but most of our rehearsals. Um, Word Baker, who who was the original director, uh, he did come back a couple of times in the time that I was in the show. I was there for almost two and a half years the first time I, I went into the show. Uh, so uh, you, had, um, you had input from the people who actually made the original production and pretty much everything was set in stone. But from the original production uh, back in 1960, one of the things they were, they were not required to have understudies. So whenever anyone got sick during the run, the stage manager would go to a list that we had of every character and every actor or actress who had played that role. So you go back to whoever had played the role the last time. And if they weren't available, you went the time before that. If they weren't available the time before that. You know, six, when, as I say, when I went to the show, there were 16 years worth of folks. Uh, so one of the other things is that uh, although the job itself did not pay a heck of a lot of money, it was a good job. You were working in New York. You could be seen. 
and you are available for auditions for other things. So people tended to stay with the show if they could. If they left the show, they would you would come back. You'd always tell the stage manager, I'm back now in case you need me, whatever. And so roles sometimes were exchanged. So someone would leave to do something else that was going to pay more and whoever had done the show before. So the role would, would come in and step back into the role. So the role was sometimes exchanged back and forth. And so that's why it took another two years before both guys that had last done it were not available and I got into the show. So so that was like 1970? No, this was this was 1976 that I got in, into the show. 76. Uh, and, and it closed uh, what, last year, 18? Yeah, it closed, uh, what, two years ago now? Yeah, it's hard to, where, where are we now? Uh, it closed yeah. in June. Uh, well, you you've actually had like a a, a decades long. Oh yes, it, it became my 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 day job, as they say. I stayed there. I played the mute for about two years, and then I became the production. I was the assistant stage manager because that's was well, that went along with playing the mute. Uh, so I did a lot of backstage things. Uh, but then I became the production stage manager, and down there you were uh, responsible for the show itself, the quality of the show. So you put it, new people into the show. Uh, you gave notes to everybody, you know, about the performances, you know, to keep it consistent um, until there was a, until uh, Tom or Harvey came in and there was going to be another rehearsal. Uh, so I did, I did that. Then I left the show. I came back into the show in, I think, 1986. This time I was playing Mortimer, the man who dies. Uh, characters always called the Indian, but that's who he was. And I played that for a couple of years. Now, in between this, I would come back for vacations and uh, um, if anyone got sick. So I'd be in and out of the show. Whenever you, whenever I came back into New York, I would call Jimmy Cook, the stage manager down at uh, the Sullivan and say, Jimmy, I'm back if you need me. And I'm sorry, it was always a great thing because you needed insurance weeks. And that was very important. So there'd always be a call. So I'd always pick up some work down there. And then um, in 2008, the, it was re it closed in 2002 after 9/11 um, in January of, of 2002. Uh, and then it there was a revival that started in 2006 up at the Snapple. And uh, Tom Jones, who uh, wrote the show, uh, and who also was the original old actor Henry in the in the show. He acted under the name of Thomas Bruce. Uh, Tom played Henry when it reopened up there. And two years later, uh, Tom was, I'll say the wrong thing, but he was about 80, and he was tired of doing it nightly. It's not an easy, you know, show. Um, there's a lot of crawling in and out of a box. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the show actually briefly closed again up at the Snapple. Um, I think in February they brought in something that didn't happen or didn't last. Uh, and we reopened the show in uh, July, I think. We went into rehearsal in June, opened in July of uh, 2008. And they had asked me to come in and uh, play Henry. So that's how I started as Henry. And then again, as I, I stayed, I stayed in the show for a year and something, and then it came up to the Majestic, left the show to come up to the Majestic to do the porch. Uh, but after that, again, it was the same thing when I would come back to New York, right. I'd call, call the folks there and say, I'm, I'm here. So I then went in, I filled in for the uh, production stage manager and for the assistant stage manager there. Uh, eventually I ended up before the show closed as the standby for all the character people for Henry, for Mortimer, uh, for the two fathers. I went on for all of these roles uh, multiple times. Uh, and and I also filled in as the stage manager if they needed somebody. So that was my decades long. Uh, the very few things I, I was saying when I, I started in 76 and in 2001, before it closed, I got to play the mute again, 24 years later, standing on basically the same chair, <laughs> looking at the same wall, holding the same stick. Now yeah. that. <laughs> this is, uh, this is the, the, next, uh, the next subject. Yes, uh, 
uh, our segue right along to other shows that I've done at the Majestic Ad in New York. That's uh, that to me. Uh, I took over the role of Mozart on Broadway from Mark Hamill, and uh, that obviously is Mark. Uh, and uh, I can't. The thing is, I can't remember how we did what how we did this photograph because obviously I'm in I'm in uh, costume for photo shoot, so I must have been taking over or else. I had been on and Mark was coming back into the show, uh, but it's always a fun picture. So you can see that's, that's a great picture, yeah. Yes, and so then <clears throat> what, 40 years later, I got to direct it, direct a production up at the Majestic. Uh, and that was quite an experience. It's just having done a show uh, for as long as I did, um, and, and, you know, any job in New York, it's a good job. So I tend to stay in the show as long as humanly possible. So I'd, uh, I'd stayed with that show for a long time. I'd had rehearsals with Peter Schaffer, uh, the author. So that gave me, you know, a little more insight into what I thought his idea of the play was. So that was, it was fun to come back and revisit it so many years later up at the Majestic and hopefully it was a halfway decent production. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it was. Um, the uh, 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 besides Amadeus and <laughs> Broadway and, and uh, the Fantastics at, at the Snapple or downtown, mm. um, you were also in the Broadway production of Dracula. Yes, that was my my first uh, uh, brush with Broadway. I was I was the understudy for Renfield, who, for those of you who know Dracula, Dracula is the fly and spider eating madman. And it's a very uh, active role. Uh, and it was, uh, at the time, this again is, this is 1980, I think, 79 or 80. <laughs> All time becomes the same for me. Um, that I, I went into that show. Uh, I actually was auditioned when I had the audition. Uh, it was for covering the role of, of Renfield, but on the tour. And... Uh, when they offered it to me, they said, no, we'd like you to stay in the city and uh, um, cover the role here. So I did, went on a lot of, uh, <laughs> many times, as we say, many times and off uh, for Renfield. It's interesting, I don't know whether it's interesting or not, it is to me that, that uh, understudies, it's a, it's a real talent in itself because once you have to learn the show and then you have to be ready to go on at any time. Um, you don't rehearse with the cast. Uh, coming into a show, you get a week's rehearsal, and that's usually with the stage manager and sometimes with the other understudies. But depending on how the, the play is covered, some folks are covering two roles and you can't, you might be covering two roles. It's hard to uh, act with yourself. Uh, so you, you know, you had your rehearsal is somewhat limited. Uh, you watch the show as many times as you can, and often you're you're not hired to do the role. You're hired to do so and so, whoever's playing it, his or her interpretation of that role. Because your job as an understudy is not to come out and become a star; it's to fill a hole, it's to fill a gap. Everybody else is going to have to adjust around you in some ways, but your job is to make that transition as easy as possible for them. So depending on the show, uh, it, it became, it was, it was very different when I went into uh, Amadeus because originally, again, I started as the cover for uh, Mozart. Uh, there's Walter and I and in, Inherit the Wind. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I originally started as the cover for um, Mozart. And uh, when I joined the show, uh, Let's see, David Dukes was doing uh, Salieri. And so when I went on, David and I would get together at half hour and just go over certain things that he needed. Uh, before I, I should preface that with before, before he knew what I could do, uh, before I'd been on, uh, there are just certain moments that he needed me to be looking at him. He needed me to laugh at that this precise moment or whatever the the thing was just to make sure that what i was doing was what he was used to um, after that uh, once everybody 
see as you do it, uh, it things somewhat relaxed. And the uh, production stage manager said, you know, no, you go ahead. You can, as long as you're keeping with the blocking, yeah. uh, your, your interpretation, you know, can can vary a little. Hey, um, you uh, you use the term cover. Yes. Right. How, mm -hmm. how is that? How is that different from understudy? Well, <laughs> it's all it's all different words. Uh, sometimes for the same thing. Standbys normally, well, normally I don't. There's no normal. Uh, you can have written into your contract or whatever it is. Uh, usually, an understudy has to be there at the theater for until the character you're covering makes his or her last entrance. Then you can go. Once they're on stage, you break your leg. Then you're you know, you're on your own. Uh, standbys often call in at half hour and the stage manager says, no, so-and-so is just fine. Uh, you're okay. Go, go away. Uh, the, you know, you didn't go, you know, your, the night was yours. Um, occasionally uh, I was allowed when I was covering things, uh, not Amadeus, because I, I also was one of the townspeople. So I was literally in the show. But uh, for Dracula, I could go to another show if I wanted to. I just had to leave the stage manager, uh, the phone number for the theater, and my seat numbers. Uh, they would have to come and get me. I very rarely went anywhere else. I, I went to the, I was there at the theater uh, every night. Uh, I, there, was one, <laughs> there was one evening, uh, Raul Julia was playing uh, Dracula, and Raul... Uh, Dracula doesn't make his first entrance until about 20 minutes into the show. His cover was an actor named Jack Betts. And Jack uh, had been uh, one of the other characters in, in Dr. Seward in the play for a long time. And uh, then he became the standby for Dracula. Uh, and Jack had called in at half hour and the stage manager said, no, everything's fine. And Jack went and, and took a nap uh, at his apartment. So 20 minutes into the show, Raul comes out to make his first entrance and the doors swing open and his, his line is, good evening. Well, he opened the doors and it was kind of like a frog's croak. <coughs> doors close, we take it back. The music happens again, the doors swing open, Dracula comes in and Raul can't say a word. I mean, there's, there's no sound coming out, it's just, so they stop the show. Uh, the stage manager immediately calls Jack back. Uh, Jack jumps into a cab, comes over to the theater. Uh, they get Jack into his outfit. Uh, Jack has to shave his mustache. He's, he's in a soap in the daytime. So the soap people had made another mustache for him. But in case he uh, had to go on, they had, they had to shave. So they did that. What they hadn't told Jack, Jack had been asleep, so he wasn't really, didn't know how much time had passed between the first phone call of everything's fine and no, it isn't, get over here. So Jack got all ready. They said, you okay? Fine. And I'm backstage and I see Jack starting to walk back over toward the dressing room because they had brought the curtain down. Well, they hadn't told Jack that the show had already been running for 20 minutes and he was about to make his entrance. He thought he had about 20 minutes to. <laughs> so Jack is walking off this way and suddenly the music for his entrance happens and you see Jack run in the opposite direction, bum, 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 back and make his entrance. He did a flawless performance, but that's the kind of thing that a, a standby has to do. And it takes a special something or other. I mean, it, I found it easy to just pop in and out of the, these things. Uh, once once the show was set in my mind and I knew what I was doing, I didn't. I was anxious to go on, but uh, it, but it is a lot of pressure for you. And the other part of it is that as an understudy, the company, the real company, doesn't know what you can or can't do. So until you go on, and then everybody takes a big sigh of relief that whenever you're on, hey, that's fine. I found I found in New York that all of the understudies were you know, as good as the people they covered. It's just somebody got the audition first or, you know, somebody's an inch and a half taller or their eyes are blue or whatever. Yeah. So yeah that yeah. was my, my understudy experience. <laughs>
Well, I, I, I know that in addition to, you know, traveling up to Western Massachusetts, you do a lot of traveling or, uh, yeah. around, around the country doing shows. Yeah, well, I, I think I counted up. I, and no, I am far from, you know, uh, there's the porch. There's so, the porch, yeah. yeah. You and Stu Campbell. Campbell. Yeah. Uh, Leo is the character. It's a wonderful, wonderful speech about almost being unfaithful to his wife. Uh, yes, uh, it's, I, I, it's fun to travel a lot. It's also, it's very difficult. I mean, everybody thinks, of, well, wasn't that, that great? Uh, it's tough to be away from family and friends and whatever for months at a time. Um, because most of my work uh, was out of town. So it was hard for my kids, you know, for me to be away. Uh, but this is how I made a living. So um, on the positive side of it, I get to say I have the biggest backyard of anybody in the world. Uh, well, I do now. I have Central Park. But uh, I have neighborhoods all over the country that I'm familiar with because I've been back to a theater two or three times. You know, it's like going back to Baldwin Street. It's it's like walking to another room of my own, of my house. And uh, I know the backyard there. I know the walk to the theater. I could be up in, I could be in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, oh, I'm uh, on Mount Adams. Uh, the museum's over there. The, the Irish pub that I go to is down the road this way. Uh, be in Cleveland, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, wherever I, you know, wherever I worked a bunch of times. Uh, it all becomes you know, part of my experience. So it's it's like having uh, uh, lots of neighborhoods that are mine. So I do like that part of it. But, you know, the, the difficult part is it's very hard for uh, folks to keep relationships going if you have to be away for two months, back for three weeks, and go out again. So. Yeah, at the, at the Majestic, you know, it's a typical uh, six-week run for us and two or three weeks of rehearsal. So yeah, um, well, that's two and a half months or something away. And yeah, that it, it is. It's a it's a nice chunk. That actually, I should say, is one of the wonderful. Sorry, I could actually speak. Wonderful parts of um, the Majestic, your run. You know, we do an what eight-week run, sometimes yeah. nine-week run. No, that's two, six. Typical six. Six, sorry. Yeah. Six weeks. It's still much longer than most other places. You know, occasionally I'll be someplace and it will be an eight week run, maybe going to be extended. But uh, normally things are rehearsal, used to, uh, rehearsal of two weeks, two and a half weeks, and then three weeks performance. Getting six weeks of performance is wonderful because the show can just naturally grow. Um, in the olden days when I started, uh, we would get sometimes four weeks rehearsal, three weeks, three and a half weeks rehearsal, and then the run of the show. Economically, that's changed, so rehearsal is cut down. So uh, the show has to grow somewhat. I mean, you know, the process is sped up uh, in that way that you open. And we've had preparation and all that, but it's nice to have a run where you settle into a role, you settle into the audience, which is such a big factor. You see what works, you see what doesn't work as much. You get to tweak things a little bit, especially in a, in a longer run where folks get to relax and then really get to dig into things. Yeah, yeah. And, and especially, uh, you know, an environment like the Majestic, which is so intimate and, the, you know, the audience yeah. is, is just right there and it's, a, it's such a wonderful thing because the uh, everybody says this. The audience is the other character in the play. And so uh, and folks ask, you know, how, how do you uh, keep things fresh for the long run? You know, I've been in a show for two and a half years at a stretch. Uh, because the audience is different every night, the show is different every night. And that's, that's a sort of a wonderful thing. Uh, it's also one of the, the great things about live theater is that, it is live. Everything changes. You know, you may think, yes, my product, my performance is set in stone, uh, but you know, little things happen all the time, and and you hopefully react to, to those things. So your performance is a little different every night. So that I mean, that does keeps things fresh to me. Well, that's what's unique about what we do, for sure. Yeah. 
that that it is live. So it's not you know like we're doing now is kind yeah. of live, but it's you know yeah. in a sense. But um, you know it's not television and it's not the no. film. And, no, know. it's it's a very it's a very different experience. Television or film is. Uh, it's is that it's a completely different animal uh, in terms of your control of your performance. I mean, you can do what you do, uh, but there's so many other people involved. Where's where's the camera? Uh, is it a close up? What are they going to? How are they going to eventually edit this? Um, we do it eight eight different ways, eight different times. Well, normally I'm I'm not playing the kind of roles that they're going to give me eight takes or something. But you do something two or three uh, times. You don't know which one they're going to pick, um, so yeah. Here, or if, they, if they pick one at all, I mean, I, 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 yes. on the cutting room floor. I, I'm just going to say I, I'm I'm on the cutting room floor of one of the season finales for Law and Order, which everybody in the world in New York has done, and I had I had a great role, uh, but they cut an entire storyline because they they were really really running uh, over in terms of time, and they cut the whole storyline that I was involved in. And so uh, I remember uh, it was at the time I had been I had come back into the Fantastic Town at Sullivan. So it was sometimes sometime before uh, 2000 and, and uh, two when it closed. Uh, it aired at 10 o'clock at night and the show came down about 10 o'clock at night. And so I had to stay. We had a theater. We had a, a TV backstage. So there wasn't time for me to get home to see this. And I didn't have a way of recording it. Uh, so I stayed alone in the dressing room at uh, at the Sullivan to watch myself in this because, you know, hey, it was my first time in Law and Order, and uh, we got to where my scene should have been, and I wasn't there. <laughs> the scene, the scene wasn't there, and of course I had called all my relatives to <laughs> said, "Yeah, watch this at ten fourteen. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be there. It'll be near the end of the episode, but I'll be there." And you know, so. So you never know. You know, sometimes you're very pleasantly surprised that you, you know, made it through. Uh, also, you sometimes look at at the role when you get it and go, "Well, this is integral to the plot. If they cut this, you know, the the plot won't make any sense." So I'm pretty sure I'm going to stay there. Maybe the camera won't be on me, but <laughs> no. okay. uh, you know, whenever we do a talkback, <laughs> JT, th this is the. Uh Performer a question that that always gets asked, and, and so, you know, as an advocate for the for our audience, I have to ask you: uh, How do you learn all those lines? That, you know, how do you how do you approach a role? Um, uh, how do it? That's a two parter, right? Yeah. Well, in terms of how do I how do I learn all those lines? Um, it becomes muscle memory in in some way. Uh, I'm lucky that okay. I'm older now. I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, truthfully. It, or what did I do yesterday? I, I'm not really sure. But I don't have a problem with, with the lines because I'm used to being able to go over this. So I start, I, I don't sit down just to memorize. I read and reread and reread the play. Um, this It actually goes into, you know, what, what's your preparation? What's your method for this my method for this is is uh, uh, reading the play uh, when I learn where what do I learn about my character I learned you learn from what the playwright has put on the page what I say what others say about me what I figure out what do I want um, and how do I go about getting that uh, it's it's from the words on the page um, we talked of course I had done Mo Mozart before uh, so there was a real character. So you can, you know, it's not like I can go look at video of Mozart. Uh, I could go look at, I actually did go look at a uh, video of Clarence Darrow uh, when we were doing Inherit the Wind. Uh, but there's only so much you can do in terms of that kind of research. Uh, it, 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 if you need to do a particular speech pattern, say, that that's quite attached to someone, yes, you, you do something about, you can do that. Uh, but the character that you're playing is the character that the playwright wrote. So doing Mozart, uh, it didn't matter what the historical facts were. What mattered was what 
Peter Schaffer. Peter was. Schaffer. Yeah. yeah, the author of the play was Peter Schaffer's Mozart. Yes, uh, I'm doing his Mozart. So that's you know that's what I have to deal with now. For me, everybody works differently. I work from the outside. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I find things. Most of the thing, and as I say, I find them reading the play. I can hear if I've got, if I've got a good playwright. Uh, Peter Schaffer was, was certainly one. I mean, for me, I could hear his words. I could hear. I, I knew how his character spoke. I knew. I did. Uh, I did do Equus at one point. Uh, I knew how uh, Alan Strang, the boy, uh, sounded from the way the the dialogue was was written. Footnote to that is yeah. part of the other part of that. That's one way of thinking. Uh, I also get it from outside things. Uh, it may be a costume piece. It may be uh, some gesture pattern. I uh, hate to use those things, but uh, th those words. Uh, but it, but it's something physical. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember with with uh, Alan Strang, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I found that character in in the sneakers that I wore when I got the worn pair of uh, of sneakers that I was going to use. Suddenly, I had the walk. Once I had the walk. I knew how this kid walked. It brought me back to that point in my life when I was 17 and unsure of myself. Um, so sometimes you you find it in the in the oddest places. I think other the the other uh, physical reality of this is that when we learn our lines, um, we often attach it to our blocking where we are on the stage. So yes, I'm near this chair. I say that line there is there is that part of it i'm one of those folks who needs to get off book i don't make all my decisions you might think i do but i don't uh about the lines but i need to be off the book because i need to look the other actor in the eye uh I, that's for me i need to i need to look at you it's, it's very difficult to get all of this looking down at my script here so I try to get also, off there as soon as I can. Yeah, I also know that you know you are you are a wordsmith yourself. You love language. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, that, that I mean that's got to be part of the process. We have a really uh, interesting question here. I guess Carly, you want to put that up from somebody in the audience? Uh, Jack joined us today. And he says, hey, JT, I never asked you, did you show up off book for the porch before I recast you in a different role on the first <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, JT, for that great question. Jack, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I did show up with most of uh, the one role memorized before we then went, oh, no, you'll play the other guy. So... We went sort of, but didn't we switch back and forth? Uh, I have to ask Jack this now because it's a it's a, a long time ago. But I think I was originally going to do Leo, and then we thought, well, maybe I'd play Pat. And we started. We did a you know like one one or two rehearsals with uh, uh, Stuart and I switching roles, and then we switched back. It's my vague memory of this, but and. As Jack will know, the only the only reason I'm I'm cast is because of my hair. I have more than Jack does, so uh, <laughs> we've always had a we've always had a, a little bit of tension going on there. But so the, so he will only call me in for roles that need a lot of hair. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Thanks for. Uh, yeah. Yes. No. But that's true. 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 I do have. I I don't come in off off book, but. I just I read and reread the play again and again and again so that I'm familiar enough with it that I can get off for a scene or two. Uh, you know, there's no way um, you can, depending on uh, also for me, it depends on the the length of the rehearsal period. Yeah, I don't have problem with memorized line, but sometimes it now takes me a little longer to do it. So uh, we <laughs> the last you? play I the last play I did at the Majestic, your play, Warren Walt Whipple. Uh, my playwright, who was also my director, <clears throat> had written a monologue. Well, they were all, I, I appeared in monologues. So, but the last one lasted for about 15 minutes where I basically told the audience everything that happens to every character after the play is done. 
and there were a lot of characters <laughs> in the play and and uh, some of them were on stage some of them were often I've, I've told folks about this before that I do remember one night uh, going through this and the and the the monologue it did it literally, literally did last 15 minutes and so uh, I got halfway through and I could not for the life of me think who the next character I was, who was I supposed to talk to? What would happen is that I would start to talk and then that character sometimes would, there were, there were some of the main characters were there on stage, but some would enter from somewhere else. And I, I was lost as to who the next person was. And I could hear people wandering around backstage and I just prayed that somebody would come out. And I think it was Jordan who, uh, came out and suddenly when I saw her, I was like, oh, okay, that's who I'm supposed to, all right. And then we could pick up right from, right from there. But, but that, for example, the reason I'm, I brought that up is that uh, that was a monologue that I had to work on, you know, before I got there. And I didn't have it done word perfect, but I did have to get that because there wouldn't be, we'd be doing so many other things that there wouldn't be enough time to try and get something that long, uh, memorized without having really kind of gotten it set beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Well, you uh, made it work. You made it work. <laughs> <laughs> we got through it. We got through it all. And that's, well, that's also one of those things about live theater is that once you're out there, boy, you got to do something. Uh, it isn't all going to stop. Uh, and we're not going to do another take of this. This is the take that uh, mm -hmm. we're going to get. So in, in some sense, uh, folks ask about this, I, I guess, that for me, uh, the stage, yes, it's scary to be out in front of all those people, all those faces looking up at you, and, and that's in one sense, but it's also, if you're lucky, and knock wood, I certainly have been, it's the safest place in the world because I'm surrounded by folks who I know will have my back. If I screw up, someone else will pick something up they have before you know if i drop a line you know the person i'm talking to will be able to go i'm i'm confident that that person will be able to to jump back and say well yes but what about and then I'll, oh well, i left that out huh? uh so in that sense if you're surrounded by good people and and you know in the course of rehearsal hopefully you you've developed relationships that you have a huge safety net in that way yes you're you're walking a tightrope. That's that's a given. But you've got a whole bunch of other folks who are going to throw you a, a lifeline if you do get caught. All right, I'm getting a message here from Carly. She says we have time for oh, too much. a question. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not shutting you up yet. No, <laughs> uh, Jennifer. She has another wonderful question here. Uh, Mortimer and the old actor are highly comedic roles. How do you enjoy playing dramatic roles versus comedic roles? Uh, actually, I think they're kind of one and the same. Uh, very dramatic things. There's a lot of comedy in them, strangely enough. Uh, and even the most comic role, in a way, you're not, I want to say you're not playing it for a laugh. If you play it for the truth of the character, it is funny. Uh, yes, the character may be exaggerated and uh henry the old actor in uh, uh the fantastics is me on steroids uh, <laughs> uh, being old and you know a little on the senile side uh, with a great love of, of theater um he's very also uh, he may be a comedic character but he's also a very real character um and within every uh, within every drama, there are strangely funny moments. Um, not not necessarily joke things, but those truthful moments. Uh, so playing it, the human yeah, comedy, you know, it, it is a it is a little different, but that has to do with the tone of the production, of the play. But in terms of the truth of your character, they are pretty much, you know. The, the same your your, your approach uh, is find a little find truth in it and then with the outer outer trappings of it it may become a little funnier because you tweak it this way or the moment may be very serious because you tweaked it that way yeah yeah uh, uh, how are we doing on time Carly we got a little bit more 
Uh, we have time for maybe final thoughts, unless if you would like to wrap things up, we're right about at the end. Okay. John Thomas. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I yeah. enjoyed it. I can't wait to get back up at the Majestic. So that'll happen. All right. Hey, uh, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in. And I just want you to know the recording of this uh, behind the curtain at the Majestic will be archived shortly. And you could get to it via our website, majestictheater.com. Uh, as I said earlier, our next behind the curtain, May 31st, 2 o'clock, with West Springfield's one and only Robbie Simpson. So <laughs> thanks again. Stay safe. Have a great week, everyone. Take care.